Good afternoon, and welcome to the Senate Committee on Health and Human Services. Uh, Madam Secretary, please proceed to call the roll. Senator Lang? Here. Senator Wynn? Here. Senator Stone? Here. Senator Titus? Here. Chair Donate? And I am here. Great. Uh, everyone is present, so please indicate um, all committee members are present. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we have a big day because of the snow delay. It's fine. Uh, we have two presentations, a joint presentation by both the UNR and the UNLV School of Public Health, and a second one from the Nevada Public Health Association. And following those presentations, we will have a bill hearing on Senate Bill 117, Senate Bill 41, and Senate Bill 161. Um, before I go into the housekeeping items, uh, since we have folks that go in and out of this meeting, just wanted to let you guys know, we do have Digital Health Day on uh, this upcoming meeting on Tuesday, so we will talk, we'll be talking about uh, technology since that was a request from the committee members. So regarding uh, housekeeping items, before we start, um, of course, there are a few housekeeping, housekeeping announcements that folks should know. Um, first things first, agenda items may be taken in a different order than listed, um, and they can be combined and so forth, and we asked uh, throughout this process that um, if you have a public comment, to of course keep it to two minutes so that everyone can participate. Uh, you can also submit your public comments in writing, either in addition to testifying or in lieu of thereof. If you wish to testify, you can sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. Um, and if you haven't, make just make sure that you're signing in uh, so we keep a record. Um, when testifying, you can turn on your microphones on to speak and off to listen. And we have listeners and viewers in Las Vegas and online and we're recording this meeting as it will be available on the legislature's website later. Um, anyone who wishes to receive copies of the committee's exhibits can go to the Nellis website, um, and you can also contact our committee manager for that process. And uh, of course, we ask everyone if they can respect the process and uh, just turn off your electronic devices uh, throughout this. So um, while we are waiting for folks and presenters to come forward, um, let's start first with the Nevada Public Health Association presentation. So we have uh, Mr. Packham, so please proceed when you are ready. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Donyate and members of the committee. For the record, I am John Packham. Uh, in my day job, I'm Associate Dean for the Office of Statewide Initiatives at the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine. I'm come uh, this afternoon on behalf of the Nevada Public Health Association. I currently serve as the association's policy director, and I'm on their board of directors and a past president. In keeping with our mission of serving as the voice for public health in Nevada in order to improve health and achieve health equity, I am pleased to provide an overview of the Public Health Association's priorities during the current legislative session. And throughout my remarks, I will be referencing our association's 2023 advocacy agenda, which I trust is in your packet. The public health community's policy priorities can actually be summarized or grouped into the following four categories. First, increase funding for public health infrastructure. Second, strengthening the public health workforce. Third, advancing evidence-based public health policy. And fourth, strengthening and safeguarding public health authority. Let me explain each one of those elements in a little more detail. Our first and top priorities increase state funding to support improvements in state and local public health infrastructure in Nevada. Now by infrastructure, what I mean is uh, first, a capable, and coordinated public health agencies and health districts at both the state and local level. Secondly, a well-qualified well and diverse public health workforce. And third, modern data and information systems needed to rapidly understand and assess public health threats. All of those require dollars. In previous legislative sessions, the NPHA has supported efforts to establish a public health improvement fund and ideally secure stable long-term funding for per capita funding for local public health authorities to use as they see fit and as new and emerging threats uh, uh, face our state. In summary, infrastructure funding is required for those agencies, people, and systems needed to promote and protect the public's health. Senate Bill 118 represents an important first step in that direction, and we uh, fully support that bill. Second, 
Our second uh, uh, priority is expanding and strengthening the public health workforce in Nevada, which will, again, require dollars and associated policy change. You'll hear more from uh, my colleagues at UNR and UNLV uh, about what they're doing to educate and train the next generation of public health uh, professionals, but it's, it's critical that we be thinking about how we can support existing staff and bringing new workers into the field, addressing pay, work conditions, and so forth. That public health uh, frontline set of workers has never been beat up like they've been beat up over the last three years. We need to have their, their back. We also need uh, to support the work of our state's two public health uh, schools, as you'll hear from uh, in a moment. But I'd also want you to be mindful of other public health workers that aren't necessarily trained in a school of public health. If you look at the top occupation in public health, it's nursing, uh, community health nursing or public health nursing. Uh, and um, uh, that also uh, needs our attention. Um, the the uh, Throughout this uh, session uh, to date, I've noticed, uh, and I'm uh, actually very encouraged by uh, several bills that uh, uh, address healthcare uh, workforce development. Uh, and a lot of those measures appear to have bipartisan support. Uh, when we think of health workforce, though, I want, uh, again, to try to keep it, uh, your forefront that the health workforce includes clinical workers, physicians, nurses. I'm at a school of medicine, so I'm very mindful of the clinical uh, workforce needs of the state, but uh, also want uh, us to have a broader view of the health workforce to also include um, uh, public health workers, health educators, epidemiologists, community health workers, and so on. Our association's third priority is advancing evidence-based population health-focused policy making in Nevada. In some instances, this will require policy change. In other cases, it will require new dollars. In many cases, it will require both. Areas in Nevada where the association believes we've made a lot of progress, but where uh, a considerable work remains includes tobacco and e-cigarette prevention. Uh, I feel like on tobacco control, we're kind of playing whack-a-mole. We've made progress on tobacco, but um, we have a mi middle school and high school uh, uh, va vaping situation that uh, uh, is deserving of the word epidemic. Um, also, think we've made progress in other areas, such as injury and violence prevention, immunizations, and vaccine-preventable diseases. But in every area where we've made success, there are still challenges. Uh, and with respect to immunizations and vaccine-preventable diseases, uh, just think of the, the uh, rise of vaccine hesitancy that we're seeing, uh, uh, loads of misinformation out there. There are plenty of uh, uh, challenges uh, that remain there. Our position is that uh, upstream evidence-based measures are needed to promote and protect the public's health. They also hold the promise of considerable returns on investment in the form of reduced downstream medical costs. Think of uh, the cost savings, for example, to our state Medicaid program. If we could cut smoking uh, rates among the Medicaid uh, population or Medicaid-eligible population by a third or in half. Our fourth and final priority uh, is a relatively new one on our radar, and it's safeguarding public health authority, particularly in the face of political polarization that defines our times in Nevada and elsewhere. Safeguarding public health authority includes supporting and strengthening the authority and flexibility of public health officials at the local, state, and national level to issue and enforce public health emergency orders and threats to public health. Protecting the physical safety of public health officials and frontline public health workers who have endured all sorts of abuse for the past three years on top of comparatively low pay and morale and demanding workloads is a priority uh, of the association. NPHA acknowledges that policymaking bodies such as the Nevada State Legislature cannot legislate social solidarity overnight or reverse our nation's uh, uh, declining trust in institutions, but again, safeguarding the authority of uh, uh, state and local uh, public health officials is uh, at the top of our uh, uh, concern or agenda right now. In conclusion, the Nevada Public Health Association's vision of a healthy Nevada requires policymakers to support funding and evidence-based policy measures that tackle upstream determinants of health. By their very nature, 
Most population-focused public health measures are consistent with recent public and private efforts to advance health equity. On matters of health equity, I would humbly submit that public health has walked that walk for the better part of a century. Indeed, I would argue that successful public health, health efforts, such as community water fluoridation, the virtual elimination of many vaccine-preventable diseases, are reminders of what late uh, 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 Paul Wellstone observed in that, quote, we all do better when we all do better. I'm happy to entertain any questions you have, and again, appreciate the opportunity uh, to share our uh, policy priorities with this committee. Thank you so much, Dr. Packham. Always appreciate your service, of course, um, and, and for joining us here today. Uh, committee members, do we have any questions for the Public Health Association? Senator Stone. Thank you, Dr. Packin, for your, your presentation. You, you touched on a few uh, issues that are, are very important to me, and one is, is vaping. You talked about we want to reduce tobacco use to re decrease the cost of Medicaid and Medicare in the future. Uh, vaping is, uh, is, is prevalent, and it's a whole new generation of kids and young adults that are getting addicted to uh, nicotine. What, what can the public health department do to educate uh, the populace that this is a uh, a very dangerous situation that uh, is going to cause significant morbidity and mortality in the future because a lot of these kids that are experimenting with these vaping devices and then go watch a movie and see a kid, uh, Brad Pitt, smoking a cigarette on, on a television show and say, I, I want to be like Brad Pitt. And now we have a whole new generation of uh, people that are addicted to cigarettes. For the record, uh, John Packham, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, uh, one is... Um, that uh, I spoke of flexible funding for state and local uh, uh, health districts and public health authorities, that would be a great start because each one of uh, uh, the three health authorities, Carson City, Southern Nevada Health District, Washoe County Health District, have very active, vibrant uh, tobacco control programs that have, have actually quite quickly pivoted uh, to the problems that you've, you've spoken of. Uh, with respect to, to vaping. So it is on their radar. We need more troops on the ground. Uh, second comment that I would have is that uh, there are recommended levels of use of uh, st uh, state tobacco taxes as well as uh, dollars from the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement from 1998, and we are uh, well below that recommended level. So I would encourage you, and we're happy to uh, speak and provide this committee with more information, but uh, we, we pay a tiny fraction of what is recommended, and those dollars are, those dollars are being used for a number of uh, uh, great purposes, including Millennium Scholarships, uh, which have benefited my institution and the students that go there, but uh, a, a lot of work remains in tobacco control, including e-cigs. And, and, and then lastly, if I may, um, uh, immunization hesitancy. Um, and I'm not talking about COVID vaccinations. I'm talking about things like MMR. Children are not getting them. We have to have herd immunity in order to protect the public. I'm sure you're aware of a, a situation that happened in England where a doctor testified on behalf of a, a lawsuit for, I believe it was MMR, and said that there was a nexus between the MMR vaccine and autism, which spread across the world and made people afraid to immunize their children. Um, how has that affected immunization rates in, in Nevada, and what can we do to better educate the constituencies here that these are proven vaccines that have saved, saved millions of lives, and uh, we need to re restore the, uh, the vaccination integrity of these immunizations to protect our kids. Uh, again, John Packham, for the record, uh, there's a long answer to that. I'll try to give you uh, the short one. Uh, I think the uh, Dr. Wakefield, I think, is who you're referring to with respect to We're still paying the price mm -hmm. uh, for that. We are still fending off. Uh, uh, claims that uh, uh, autism is linked to that, sadly. Uh, and I think that, in addition to uh, uh, the uh, experience of the pandemic, uh, I, I would leave my uh, 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 public health colleagues to respond to that directly, but uh, our rates for childhood immunizations, adult immunizations, uh, HPV, and so forth, they were already uh, low to the middle pack to already, uh, already to begin with, and uh, they're, they're not going up. Uh, uh, like they should. And I would add, there's been a lot of postponed vaccinations that we still haven't seen um, uh, back in the clinics and so forth. So again, I'll make another plug for uh, your local health districts and health authorities who are, uh, that's what they're set up to do. But again, more, more troops on the ground are needed. 
Thank you very much. We need to be in for the long haul, too. On, I think um, we could do to help please uh, advise us on how we could better educate our, our constituencies. Thank you. Happy to. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Packham. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, at this time, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to agenda item for Senate Bill 177. I'm looking at Senator Loop, Dunder Loop. We're, we're going to go out of order, so we have to do Senate Bill 177, and then uh, we'll come back to the presentation from the UNLV and UNR School of Medicine or Public Health. Okay, at this time, we will go ahead and open the hearing on Senate Bill 177. Uh, or, one second, I'm like trying to see. Uh, this bill revises provisions relating to Medicaid and uh, coverage for certain uh, medications. So, uh, Senator John Darrell Loop, welcome to the Senate HHS. Please proceed when you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. It's been a at least a whole session since I've been in HHS, maybe. So, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Donate and members of the committee. I am Marilyn Dondero Loop, representing Senate District 8 in Clark County. I am pleased to come before you this afternoon to present Senate Bill 177. This bill codifies an existing requirement that Medicaid covers antipsychotic and anticonvulsant drugs under certain circumstances and extends the requirement to health, health maintenance organizations and managed care organizations. Additionally, this bill will authorize the Commissioner of Insurance to penalize those who do not comply. First, I will provide you with some brief background information on mental health in this state. In Nevada, over 20% of adults reported having a mental health disorder. And in almost 6% of adults, the disorder is so severe that it causes serious functional impairments in daily living activities and the overall quality of life. The bill intends to remove barriers associated with access to mental health and other health services by protecting those individuals that rely on antipsychotics and anticonvulsant drugs. Antipsychotic medication are any pharmacological pharmacological agent used to control the symptoms of serious mental illness, such as those that occur with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and even some severe forms of anxiety and depression. Anticonvulsants are described as drugs used to reduce the frequency or the occurrence of epileptic seizures or to terminate an ongoing seizure. Some anticonvulsants, such as valparaisic acid, or lamotrigines are used as mood stabilizers to treat mental illness. You can tell I'm not a doctor, Dr. Titus. Though there are protections written into Medicaid manuals regarding anticonvulsants and antipsychotics, not having these protections codified in NRS leaves room for additional barriers to be put in place. For example, many other states require that more than one failure of a preferred prescription for their Medicaid patients before covering another one, leaving the individual to deal with withdrawal symptoms and other discomforts that come from gaps in treatment. Some states require the failure of two or three, and this is not something that I would like to see happen to our fellow Nevadans. I'll now go over the bill for you. Section 1 of this bill codifies the existing requirement for Medicaid to provide for the coverage of any typical or atypical antipsychotic medication or anticonvulsant medication that is not on the list of preferred prescription drugs upon the upon demonstrating therapeutic failure of one drug on that list to adequately treat the condition of a recipient of Medicaid. Section 2 of this bill clarifies that this requirement will apply to health maintenance organizations. Section 3 of this bill authorizes the Commissioner of Insurance to suspend or revoke the Certificate of Authority of an HMO who fails to comply with this requirement. 
And Section 4 of the bill clarifies that the requirement of Section 1 will apply to managed care organizations. Now with me here today is my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Abby Bernhardt. Abby is the former Miss Lyon County and the current Miss Nevada, Virginia City under the Miss America organization and is a mental health advocate to create positive policy change. Thank you, Abby, so much for being here today. And please go ahead when you're ready. Hi, my name is Abby and I am with the National Alliance on Mental Illness. At three years old, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I experienced manic episodes with rapid cycling. I had so much anxiety and sadness and anger all at once. By middle school, the mania turned to depression. I tried to commit suicide at 10 years old. Years were wasted while my depression intensified. Doctors fought Medicaid trying to manage my medications, but lacked control over what medications were approved due to the power of insurance. I know the importance of medication. It gave me back my life and a way to manage my mental health. My doctors were able to choose medications based, were not able to choose my medications based on my needs. I would not have suffered so much trauma for such a long period of time. The memories of my suicide attempt left me with reoccurring nightmares, where I would relive the horrible day and every detail that led me to the worst day of my life. Now, when I get depressed, I fear the nightmare I once lived. I stand with those who are struggling. There can be better days ahead. I support doctors' control over medication. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to look behind me. Okay. We will, um, Abby's mother is going to join us, but she was coming from work. So we'll go ahead um, with Robin Reedy, the Executive Director of NAMI, the Nevada, an organization of family, friends, and individuals whose lives have been impacted by mental illness. NAMI offers support groups, educational programs, online resources, and advocacy to improve the quality of life for persons who are affected by mental illness. Thank you, my name is Robin Reedy. I'm the Executive Director of NAMI Nevada. That's the National Alliance on Mental Illness here in Nevada. And we are here to support this bill. We have been pursuing removing medication barriers for all of our families. When a family gets a letter from the insurance company saying they have to shift or change a medication, it's like dropping a bomb into that family environment. Because if that individual has been stable for that long, changing meds is the most dangerous time. I have heard story after story of families who have told me that it was during a medication change that someone tried to complete suicide. And many of them are sadly very successful at that. We need to be aware that a non-medical change is a bomb to a family and a life. How many drugs should a patient go through before a drug that works is allowed? How much time out of a person's life should we take because it's not necessarily on the preferred drug list? We are trying to minimize this by offering this bill. We need to shift our thinking that if the first drug from the PDL does not work, let's move to a drug that the doctor and the patient know might work better. So many things happen in the interim. I have heard of people going two years trying to get on the right medicine. Two years out of a young person's life is a long time. In the mental health world, changing drugs that change the brain is the most dangerous time. Let's limit that time. Thank you. 
And thank you very much, um, Chair. I think what we'd like to do is if we could have some questions while we're awaiting our next guest, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Don Darrell Loop, and of course to our presenters, and of course, Abby, to share, for sharing your story. Um, I will go ahead and allow our committee members to ask any questions at this time. Uh, we'll start with Vice Chair Wynn. Not really a comment, or more of a comment than a question. Um, thank you, Senator, for bringing this bill, and thank you for sharing your story and coming here. Um, I know I've been very open about my experiences with my mother, who is bipolar, and um, sorry if I get emotional. I just remember when she was first diagnosed, watching her go through a process that felt like a decade, and it was probably a close to two years trying to figure out what kind of medication would work for her. Um, and when she finally got that, um, I've seen the troubles when she was taken off of that medication. And sadly, she's had many of those attempted, thank you, thank God, it was attempted suicide that was not successful. Um, so I appreciate this medication. I think this will help change lives if we're able to pass this policy. That's all. Thank you so much, Senator Wynn. Uh, Senator Titus, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. I, I appreciate you, uh, Senator, bringing the bill forward, but unfortunately, I think that the word, it doesn't get to, to what I see as a practicing physician, the, the problem that I've seen. I understand what you're trying to do. My concern in, in my practice has been um, I get somebody stabilized on antidepressants, antipsychotic medications, anticonvulsants, but then the formulary, whether it's Medicaid, their MCO, or whatever insurance company they have, changes. And so that drug is no longer covered, and we have to switch them to another one when I would really like to see this bill fix that because this bill doesn't fix that. This bill says that once they were on a drug, whether it works or not, um, if it doesn't work, you can put them on whatever, but it doesn't address the problem with these patients come in on a medication, and then the insurance companies changes their formulary, and you have to switch them. Um, and so if the, if the bill would say, you know, once it's stabilized on a drug, they, they have the doc and the patient, if that's the best drug for them, should be allowed to continue that drug regardless of whatever the formula is, not have to change that. Because I'm not seeing that that fixes this problem. Maybe legal can tell us it will, because I don't think it does. I think there's still that void where I have personally witnessed it as a, as a physician, and it's a huge area. But it's not just antipsychotics, hypertensive medications. I can get a patient stabilized on a blood pressure medication. They could be on it for five years, and then suddenly... The formulary changes, and I have to work them through the whole process of a new medication. And that's, you know, I'd love to see this bill expand to cover that. And that's, that's my concern. It doesn't go quite far enough. Thank you for that. And I'll ask um, Ms. Reedy to come up and maybe address that real quick. Thank you. Senator Titus, from one Robin to another, I absolutely agree with you. Name I would love record, to please. see. Oh, I'm sorry. Name for the record, please. Uh, Robin Reedy, uh, NAMI, Nevada. Uh, I absolutely agree with you on the, at that bill, but I also recognize that that bill would come up against uh, a huge fiscal note through Medicaid. Uh, and then I had a huge fight through the insurance companies. But I feel that pain just on my own Synthroid. I mean, I have to take Synthroid. It's the only one that works. I don't have a thyroid. And every time I change insurance, I have to justify the fact that that's all I can take. And that's the process that's there. But I will tell you, you will see me sitting here in the coming sessions making that argument because that will fix a lot of other people. This is our step at codifying a regulation into legislation so that as we go forward and things change in the medication world on the boards and everything, that they can't make someone go through two drugs or three drugs 
and in some states four and five drugs before they get the drug that works. So we would like to legislate this regulation so that our people are protected in the future. Follow up, Mr. Chair? So uh, thank you for that. Um, in regards just to this wording in this bill, however, um, they are put on one medication and then if that medication fails, then it's open-ended to be allowed to be put on any other medication. And I'm wondering if there isn't any, um, if you talk, if there wasn't a fiscal note on that component, because some of these drugs, the span of what these drugs can cost from anywhere from a, a dime for Benadryl versus thousands of dollars for some of these newer medications, if there's any spectrum then on that second tier. Robin Reedy again, uh, through you, Chairman, to uh, Senator Titus. The, the fact is, is we're trying to mimic what the regulation already says. So if there's some barrier or, or guardrail there, uh, I, I would assume the guardrail would still be there. But I, I can't, I don't know that for a fact. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Senator Stone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Ms. Reedy. It's very nice to see you again. I enjoyed uh, going to your NAMI meeting in, in Reno and appreciate all the good work that you're, you're doing. So um, I'm a pharmacist and I've operated six pharmacies over the past 42 years. And while Dr. Titus has to make a difficult decision about uh, a formulary change, I get to confront the patient and tell him, your medication that you've been stabilized on for five years is no longer covered by your insurance and therefore we got to find an alternative and I didn't make the phone call to the doctor and and you get all kinds of hostilities and, and rightfully so. So um, I don't think uh, the, the health plans truly understand that they're playing Russian roulette with psychiatric drugs and forcing a patient who's been stabilized on one drug to go to another. I'll give you an example. If you have somebody that is on an antidepressant, we'll just say that the drug Pristique, right? And let's say that they've been stabilized for five years, haven't had a major depressive illness, and now it's no longer on a new formulary that they have to go to, let's say, a drug called Cymbalta. So what they don't take into account, and most clinicians and pharmacists understand this, that when you abruptly stop taking a drug like Pristique, you go through a significant withdrawal syndrome that is, can make somebody very, very sick. And they gotta live through that experience for five to seven days. And then when they're given a second drug that isn't gonna work, right? And maybe they need to go back to the Pristique, now it's gonna take another week for that drug to go back into the system where it starts working again. So every, every drug, uh, you, you try to match the, the, the pharmacology with the drug with the symptoms and the chemistry of the patient. And just because the doctor tries one drug, if it's a new patient and it's a new, new condition, there's no guarantee that the second drug that they try is going to work, right? So they may have to go to a third, a fourth, or a fifth choice. Um, but what I would like to do, though, is when you have psychiatrists uh, that are prescribing these medications, they are looking at a certain pharmacological class to treat a condition that they are diagnosing. Uh, when the one drug doesn't work, then they want to go to a different pharmacological class. I believe the doctor should be entitled to get that, whether it's an expensive drug or whether it's an inexpensive drug. And usually there is a generic alternative to most of the pharmacological classes. There isn't for some. And in some cases, when you're dealing with somebody that has the potential of committing suicide, if they aren't taken out of their depressive illness, then it should be justified that they get that. So just to piggyback on my senator physician friend, um, I, I believe that when you have patients that have been well treated on medications, that they should be grandfathered into any formularies that come in. That I'd like to see put into statute, whether in this bill or in, in another bill, because um, you're dealing with uh, the possibility when you're dealing with psychosis, you know, that an antipsychotic agent makes somebody. Uh, uh, exist in the realm of reality, and if you give them the wrong drug, they're going to go into psychosis and maybe do things that you wouldn't want to see them do, and maybe end up in the hospital where a cost insurance company is trying to save a few bucks on a drug, uh, a lot more money when they get, when they get admitted. So um, 
I, I really like this bill. I, I really want to support this bill. Um, but I hope that we can put some more teeth into it and make sure that when a, a patient has a psychiatric drug that they've been well stabilized for years, that because of formulary change, the grandfather and the insurance company is mandated to provide it. And if we are going to go to a step two, that the physician should have the choice but to use the lower cost alternative if it meets a pharmacological class that satisfies that patient in order to keep some of the costs down that uh, Senator, my doctor, Senator Titus was, I don't know if I'm supposed to mention names, but was alluding to. We want to keep the cost affordable where we can, but we never want to compromise on cost and uh, have somebody take their life or not give them the appropriate medications that they need. So be interested in your, in your comments on that. Through the chair to you, Senator Stone. Um, you're speaking my language. I, I yourself on the record, please. Uh, Robin Reedy, you. NAMI Nevada. Uh, you're speaking my language. But I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I want to protect the largest group of people that I can with this bill by legislating what we already have codified. Because I do see in the future with pooling that's going on and what that pooling has done in other states that that outreach to save as much money as they can at the cost of people. And so when you start talking bigger money, that, that fiscal note, and you start bringing in insurance companies to go against it, that's a hard fought bill. I would love to see that, but what I would really like to see is this helping as many people now and, and working toward exactly what you said. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Don Darrell Loop, do you want to introduce us to our, your other co-presenter? Thank you so much, Chair, for letting us um, have a little discussion in between. I'd love to introduce you to Abby's mother, um, Erica Friedenberg, and she has um, Zoomed in here from work. So thank you very much for joining us, and please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erica. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, basically, I'm going to cover some information maybe that Abby wasn't able to cover because she's looking at from the, a child's view. But uh, being diagnosed at three years old, medication has always been a huge part of our life. And insurance company, much like you were saying, they have formularies and they have lists and it really depends on what that list is to what medication is approved. And in Abby's case, it wasn't any different. And so the thing that I found the most terrifying is that I either couldn't get the medication or it was on a list and you had to go through all these other medications before it got to her. So the one thing that I want to stress here is how it affected Abby because there were some key things that were said here today that really do apply to her. And that is the fact that Abby would be on one medication leading up to another medication and that medication may not work for her. Now you have side effects because you're coming off of that medication and you're putting her on another medication and that has, it takes time for those medications to take effect. So over a period of about a year, this intensified and it got to the point where my daughter became suicide at 10 years old. That is absolutely the most terrifying thing that I've ever had occur. You try to stop it at any cost, but you, no matter what you do, you can't stop it. I tried to hospitalize her, I tried different doctors, I tried writing letters, I tried it all. She finally, um, she was admitted to the hospital 13 times in one year because of it. And like you said, just think about how much money would have been saved if she just would have had the right medication put in place. And so from that, continuing on that journey, medications are expensive, you can't pay for them yourself. Abby was on medication, Abilify, $1,000 to cover. Nobody has $1,000 to cover that. So you have to go with these lists, you're forced. Abby was hospitalized 13 times in one year. And then they, give me, they gave me a list. And this list was to find out what suicidal tendencies she had. And if she had them, was she capable of acting on them? Yes, she's very much uh, capable of acting on them. Um, it was the most terrifying experience I absolutely ever had with my child or anything in my life. You feel so responsible for anything that happens to them, getting them the help that they need. But in this situation, there was nothing that I could do. It was totally helpless. So uh, one thing 
I, I, I just want to stress is that I, I really don't want this to happen to another child, another loved one in the community, when it can be stopped now. If that power was transitioned really from formularies and list over to the doctors, and the doctors made that choice on medications instead of the insurance company, things would look so much better. And not only would it be cost savings, but think about how many, how many members in the community we can save and we can help. So I do support this bill. So I, I stand here today and I just hope that change can be made so that we can, we can make that difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I don't know if you have additional questions. Uh, I think we're ready to move on to testimony. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Chair and committee members, for considering Senate Bill 177. And Senator, we'll talk offline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Dondero Lupin, of course, uh, to your co-presenters for sharing their personal stories. Uh, we'll move on to uh, testimony in support of SB 177. Um, of course, I remind uh, the folks in this audience and anyone joining virtually to please limit your uh, remarks to two minutes each. Um, it's okay to say ditto if similar comments were made before. So we'll go ahead and start with support. So uh, please state your name for the record. Uh, we'll go from this side down to the other. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Leah Case here today on behalf of the Nevada Psychiatric Association. Uh, Leslie, Dr. Leslie Dixon did submit a letter detailing the NPA's support of this bill, and I just wanted to get on record and say uh, this is one great step in protecting Medicaid patients' access to medication. Thank you. Hi, my name's Shauna Alves. This is my first time doing this, so sorry. Um, I've dealt with mental health since I was 25 years old, and I've been put on different medications. I have severe depression, severe anxiety. Um, one medication, I was in the closet pulling my hair out, and I'm still trying to find the right medications. And during this time, I self-medicated for years and became an addict. Now I'm sober, going on almost five years. I'm a certified peer recovery support specialist through the state. I'm a state certified community health worker and just started working the warm line for NAMI. Um, it's hard to be switched from medication to medication. It doesn't make it okay to self-medicate. I'm not saying that. But when I work in the community in Yerington and I see people with mental health issues self-medicating when things could be different for them. If it was just, I don't know what really to say except I really support this. And it was, it's hard. And it's still hard every day. It's even hard to get a counseling appointment or a therapy appointment that's not that far out, that's not Zoom. So thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Tess Opferman here on behalf of the Human Services Network. The Human Services Network represents nearly 50 organizations in northern and rural Nevada, some of which are healthcare and mental health healthcare providers. Our providers know how hard it is to find the right medication to treat mental health, and we are in full support of this bill because we hope that it eases that burden a little bit and ensures that patients and providers are able to prescribe the medications that most fit a patient rather than needing to look at a pre-approved list determined by insurance companies. We feel strongly that this needs to be up to the, the patient and the doctor um, and, and not the insurance company. So on that, we're in full support and we urge your vote on this bill. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chair Dundantje. Uh, Alex Tanchek on behalf of Silver State Government Relations, representing the Nevada Advanced Practice Nurses Association uh, here in support of SB 177. Uh, we believe in the uh, patient-centered model of healthcare and believe this is an important measure for patient well-being. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Watkins, for the record. I'm the Executive Director of the Nevada State Medical Association. 
The association is the largest physician advocacy group in the state, and they are in support of this bill as it continues the um, continuity between the patient and the physician. Thank you, Senator uh, Dondero Loop, for bringing this bill forward and all the co sponsors. Good afternoon, Chair Doniante, members of the committee. My name is Jimmy Lau with Ferrari Reader Public Affairs representing Dignity Health St. Rose Dominican. St. Rose is the largest nonprofit uh, hospital system in the Las Vegas Valley. Uh, one of the points that the presenters mentioned that I really wanted to emphasize is that one of the risks of switching your psychiatric medications is landing in a mental health crisis. When that happens, you end up in an emergency room. This is a good policy and we would urge the committee's support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Susan Fisher with McDonald Carano speaking on behalf of Northern Nevada Hopes and per your direction, sir, ditto. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone else in Carson City? We don't have anyone here. Anyone in Las Vegas? And anyone, BPS, anyone virtual? If you'd like to testify in support, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Good day, this is Dr. Barry Cole. Hi, this is Dr. Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y-C-O-L-E. I apologize, I cannot be present. I came back from our state psychopharmacology conference with a fairly bad cold and don't want to infect you. I share Dr. Titus's concern that prior authorization needs to be minimized across the board, not just for psychopharm, but for all classes. That said, I'm an incrementalist at heart. I want to get something accomplished in this session. The Nevada Psychiatric Association, the American Psychiatric Association, our state medical society are all in support of lowering the prior authorization burden. The reason this matters is not every medication works for every single patient, and some, the ones that actually are specific to the condition the patient has, can be much more expensive than their generic alternatives. Lumateperone, a month supply, $1,437. Lorazidone, a month supply, $1,383. But these two medications are actually specific for bipolar depression, whereas the other medications we often use are for the manic side or the mixed side. Um, yes, there should be grandfathering. Yes, for some medications like clozapine, it's good to try two other medications first because the toxicity burden is so great with weekly blood testing. But with our newer second generation medications, we're making remarkable progress and we should take our gains where we can get them. Probably the nickname for this bill is reducing medical begging because I find that when I'm advocating for a patient, I have to sell somebody over the telephone that this makes good sense. Please support this bill. I think it's really good medicine. Thank you. Good Caller, afternoon. My name is Bill. My name is Bill Big, B I E G, and I am on the board of directors for the Winnemucca Ministerial Association. We oversee the food bank and the soup kitchen here in Winnemucca. Uh, I'm also a recovering alcoholic with over eight years of sobriety and very successfully working several 12 step programs. Uh, I encounter people with uh, mental illnesses constantly on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can say that from Winnemucca, because we don't have a, a, a psychiatrist here, uh, that everything has to be done telehealth. So all the referrals are done through uh, clinicians and practitioners here. Um, and I support SB 177 because it gives the physician the opportunity to prescribe the medication necessary. I know some of them uh, actually cause uh, suicidal ideation and those things need to be looked at and addressed. So uh, Winnemucca supports SB 177. Thank you. 
Chair, there are no more callers for support at this time. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and move on to anyone in opposition here in Carson City. We don't have anyone. Uh, BPS, is there anyone virtual? If you'd like to testify in opposition, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for opposition at this time. Thank you so much. And anyone in this room for testifying in neutral? Anyone virtually? If you'd like to testify in neutral, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Dundell Loop, did you have any closing remarks? I just want to thank you all for your time for this so important subject. And um, I just think that it's time for us to help those people in Nevada who need the most help. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, we want to thank you for bringing this uh, tough issue, which we know is very personal for many of us. And so uh, we'll continue to work on that issue. And we'll go ahead and close this hearing. So um, just for the folks that are in this room, the way that we're going to continue this order is we'll go back to the presentations. So we'll go to the School of Public Health um, between UNR and UNLV. And then after that, we'll go to Senate Bill 41. And then uh, the uh, final bill would be uh, Senate Bill 161. So just giving everyone the coordination of what we expect so far. Okay, so for this presentation item, uh, we have with us members from the UNR and the UNLV School of Public Health. Uh, proud alum, we'll always be uh, happy to share that. Uh, with us, we have Megan Kumlossi, who is the Associate Director of the School of Public Health, and then we have Dean Gerstenberger from UNLV joining us virtually. So, uh, Ms. Kumlossi, please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Donate and members of the committee. My name is Megan Kamlasi, and I am the Associate Director of the Center for Public Health Excellence within the School of Public Health at UNR. I'm here today on behalf of our Dean, uh, Muge Akbinar Elchi, who regrets she was unable to be here and join you, but wanted to express her gratitude for the opportunity to present about the school. Um, and with me today is Associate Dean Wei Yang, who is available to help answer questions and provide information at the end of our presentation. I'm also delighted to be joined virtually by Dean Chong, Gerstenberger at our counterpart school at the UNLV School of Public Health. And we are here today to talk to you about our common interest in improving the health of communities in Nevada um, through educating and training both the current and future public health workforces, as well as through community engagement and partnerships. The UNR School of Public Health is one of 64 schools accredited by the Council on Education for Public Health. UNLV is also in this group as well. We have 2,000 students in our two undergraduate programs, as well as about 300 students in our five graduate programs, which includes a PhD in public health. We're very proud that four out of five of our graduates stays in Nevada. Uh, they end up working in careers in state and local health agencies. They work at ma major medical centers. They work at nonprofits and community-based organizations in the state. Um, and like many academic programs, our faculty and students are involved in research, and they're recognized nationally and internationally for work related to issues like substance abuse, environmental epidemiology, and behavior risk factor surveillance, among other things. Um, but we don't only do academic things. Uh, we also serve communities throughout the state in a variety of ways. Um, and the first is both UNR and UNLV serve as the pipeline or a major pipeline for public health practitioners in the state um, for this very important workforce. Our alumni are represented within all state and local public health agencies. Um, and some of our most notable um, alumni are in uh, leadership roles uh, at the state. So as the state's chief medical officer, we have uh, alum in leadership positions at the Division of Public and Behavioral Health, in the governor's office, and um, as directors of local health agencies. Um, but we don't only educate the next generation of public health practitioners, we also provide opportunities to train and upskill the existing workforce. Um, which is important because the vast majority of the public health workforce does not have traditional training or formal training in public health. 
We also provide training, technical assistance, evaluation, research, and services in communities throughout the state. And a lot of this work in particular happens through our four centers, which expand the school's reach and impact beyond the campus and into the community. So you have a folder with um, a one-pager about the School of Public Health, and that lists the four, the four centers that we have. And then you have a couple other one-pagers that provide a little bit more detail on those centers. Um, the Center for Application of Substance Abuse Technologies, or CASAT, works to improve substance use prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery, support services through training, and by helping organizations, communities, states, and the workforce apply evidence-based practices. Um, and they are a leader in these areas in the state and nationally. And the Nevada Public Health Training Center is the other I'd like to highlight. It, it conducts community-engaged uh, research. It designs training programs, facilitates capacity building, and workforce development. In 2022, the center developed and provided training to almost 3,500 public health practitioners. Um, and it's working to help build capacity in state and local public health agencies. You've heard a lot about the workforce shortages um, and just kind of work overload among these the folks working in these agencies. And so our teams are facilitating or helping lead uh, the Division of Public and Behavioral Health's pursuit of accreditation. And we're also working to help build capacity of county health officers in rural areas of the state, among other things. Um, I'd also like to highlight our, uh, our work in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic because it really was a statewide effort and the School of Public Health did a lot in this area. Uh, we hired, trained, and managed more than 100 staff for Washoe County Health District and Carson City Health and Human Services. These were folks like contact tracers, call center staff, testing site staff, disease investigators, and the list goes on. We developed COVID-19 trainings and webinars as well as certifications um, and lots of courses for public health professionals, both who were in the workforce prior to the pandemic and those who joined to respond to the pandemic. We developed and led outreach projects to uh, fight misinformation and address vaccine hesitancy in certain communities. And we did that in partnership with uh, community and faith-based organizations. And the last thing I'd like to help uh, highlight is just our work uh, in establishing academic health departments. Um, our centers and the School of Public Health have strong relationships with our state and local governmental public health agencies. Um, and like the rest of uh, public health or the public health field, we need to make uh, the most efficient use of the limited resources that we have. And so in an effort to enhance the state's capacity, we are establishing academic health departments. These are similar to teaching hospitals, um, but where a teaching hospital formalizes a relationship and integrates work between a hospital and a medical school, an academic health department formalizes affiliation and integration between a school of public health and a governmental public health agency. Um, it provides mutual benefits mutual benefits to both entities around education, research, service, and partnership. Um, and so the idea is really that academia can inform public health practice and public health practitioners can inform the academic programs. Um, it's an opportunity to enhance work-based learning experiences, internships, fellowships, to expand the public health agency's capacity um, and enhance research collaboration among the institutions as well. It's also a great opportunity to develop the pipeline. Um, the majority of people who work in public health, like I mentioned, don't have formal training in it. And so we're really working cr to create the pipelines and opportunities to help those folks advance through the public health pipeline and move up to become uh, the state's public health leaders. So at this point, the School of Public Health at UNR has uh, an academic health department agreement with Washoe County Health District, and we're very excited to announce that just a couple of weeks ago, the entire University of Nevada, Reno, finalized an academic health department agreement with the entire Department of Health and Human Services, which just holds huge potential opportunity for enhancing collaboration and expanding the capacity of, um, of what the state can do, what the university can do. It's a very exciting opportunity. Um, and UNLV also has academic health department agreements with uh, the Southern Nevada Health District um, down south. So we do a lot of collaboration and have lots of partnerships and integration with our public health partners. And one of our great partners is the UNLV School of Public Health. And so at this point, I'm happy to hand it over to Dean Gerstenberger, who's going to talk a little bit about his school, as well as some of the common um, challenges that we face in the areas where we collaborate. Thank you. For the record, uh, Sean Gerstenberger. I'm the Dean of the UNLV School of Public Health. 
Uh, thank you, Megan, for the soft handoff, and congratulations on the excellent work that you're doing up there at UNR. We are certainly on the same team. Um, I will not reiterate all of the degrees that we offer that are similar to those at uh, UNR, all the public health degrees, uh, but I did want to add that at UNLV, we also have uh, the only undergraduate and graduate accredited programs in healthcare administration in the state of Nevada, so we do offer those. Uh, similar to UNR, we have about 1,000 undergraduate students in our public health and healthcare administration degrees, and a little over 400 graduate students in our various different graduate programs. Um, one of the things that I am most proud of is that our students at UNLV self-identify 80% as racial and ethnic minorities in our degree programs. And we know that's important as we support our public health workforce uh, to ensure the continuity and the efficacy of those workers. The School of Public Health, like UNR does much more than simply educate students. We are very active in research. Uh, we have about 170 total employees, only 40 of which are tenure track faculty. But those 40 tenure track faculty are spectacular. And last year alone, they brought in just a few thousand dollars short of $15 million in extramural funding from competitive sources like NIH, CDC, HRSA, and many other of the uh, very common agencies where we acquire funding. Um, we also, like UNR, collaborate very closely with our community. And this semester alone, we have 59 internship students placed with community partners all over the Las Vegas Valley and really all over the state for that matter. I'd like to highlight just one or two other projects within the school. We certainly don't have time to highlight them all. Uh, but keeping on the theme of COVID, obviously, uh, the UNLV School of Public Health uh, stepped up to collaborate with the Southern Nevada Health District. We received a $5.1 million grant from the state to develop and lead a contact tracing team. Uh, we took a little different approach. We trained 240 UNLV students, and we took 15 experienced doctoral students from our epidemiology and biostatistics program and train them in to run a completely student-run uh, contact tracing team. Those 240 students spoke over 30 different languages, which is pretty spectacular. They investigated over 38,000 cases in Southern Nevada, which is one out of every six cases that were done in the Southern part of the state. Uh, we worked very closely with our partners at the Southern Nevada Health District and the Nevada State Health Division to ensure the security of those data, the continuity of those databases, so no confidential information was released. And I think it's just one example of how when our faculty like Dr. Brian Labus and our community partners and students work together, how we can really solve public health problems. Uh, another thing I would like to highlight, um, similar to UNR, we have lots of centers, laboratories, institutes, um, coalitions that do great work in our community. I'd just like to very briefly highlight one or two of those. Uh, one that we're very proud of is our Nevada Institute for Children's Research and Policy, which has been around for a very long time. This is primarily a grant-funded group. It has 38 grant-funded employees. They brought in over $2.4 million last year. And it houses initiatives like Prevent Child Abuse Nevada, uh, does projects related to the Kindergarten Health Survey, Safe Sleep Programs, and participates on the state's child death review team, just to name a few. Um, it is a really spectacular group that seems to be involved in all things related to children and children's health within the state. And then lastly is uh, I'd like to highlight some of the work of our Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition. Uh, this is really a statewide effort that includes our colleagues uh, up north and uh, designed to really improve the health and welfare of Nevada residents with a particular focus on those that bear a disproportionate burden of disease, which often is racial and ethnic minorities. To do that, we have over 80 partners and got 36 new partners this year alone uh, for a total of over 300 coalition members that formed work groups uh, focusing on culturally appropriate and critical, uh, credible transfer of information to our communities related to the COVID um, outbreak, the COVID vaccines, vaccine resistance, and now it is launched to really act as a springboard for other efforts in mental health, um, and a great way to reach the communities. There are work groups that are comprised of our faculty and staff, our partners from around the state, 
And we focus on different groups, uh, including the African American, Asian Pacific Islander, Native American groups, Latinx, LGBTQ, and deaf and blind communities to ensure that we are giving them and working with them to create credible information in a culturally appropriate manner. Uh, we also do trainings uh, on community-based participatory research, grants management, uh, health communication, and other pertinent issues in uh, educated a large number of people across the state. So with that, you can see that UNR and UNLV work together on a lot of things. And I wanna highlight some collaborations. We often hear about where we compete, but we don't often get to hear about how we collaborate and how we can work together and how that advances the state. So I wanna briefly highlight just two quick things. One is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's the nation's premier system of health-related telephone surveys that collect data about Nevada residents, in our case specifically, or US residents, in our case specifically in Nevada. UNR has led this initiative with UNLV School of Pol as a co-investigator for the last 10 plus years. They conduct the surveys in the north, in Carson City and Reno and in the rural areas, while UNLV works to collect the surveys in the greater Las Vegas metropolitan area. Many of the metrics that you heard about today um, incidents and prevalence of tobacco use, diseases, exercise, fruit and vegetable consumption are gathered from that very survey, which helps us direct policy and initiatives and funding for the state. It's a great example of what we can do when we work together. Um, similarly, the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition that I mentioned earlier, we work very closely with UNR and partners in the North to create focal groups and work groups and listening sessions in key partners in the native community and the Hispanic community in the North, which were spearheaded by UNLV to contribute to the body of knowledge to better communicate credible information to these important populations. And we value that uh, partnership to a great extent. And so last but not least, uh, the Dean of UNR and myself meet on a very regular basis, at least once a month. And we have come up with a collaborative proposal to foster interdisciplinary research between the two universities. We feel like that if we get together, we really can't be beat. And so we have uh, created some working sessions to introduce our faculty to another, to organize them in breakout sessions around specific topics. And we are each kicking in $10,000 from our schools to create pilot projects and mini grants where faculty from the two schools can apply together to improve the health and welfare of the state. And we hope that this acts as a model for all of the other schools. So finally, we want to give you an opportunity to know where you can help us and what we can do. And uh, I will start this and then I will hand it back to Megan. So one of the challenges that we have, uh, like Dr. Paco mentioned, is funding and specifically the lack of flexible funding. Uh, we know that in Nevada, we are last, we are 50th in the per capita funding for public health at only $72 per person per year. Uh, we would like to increase that and the reason that is, is because those are the monies that go to support many of our prevention, promotion, and protection activities throughout the state. Without those in place, we see things like the high rates we have of teen pregnancy, sexually transmitted disease, food insecurity, and access to mental health care that we all want to improve. We need more flexible funding for infrastructure and workforce development from the state to support the two schools that work in these initiatives and improve those health outcomes. And second, we wanna improve our ability to get competitive extramural funding. Often due to the limited staffing and resources we have in these areas, we don't have the data, we don't have the personnel, or they simply don't have the time to write these competitive proposals, which is another way to bring money into the state. We would love to find ways to help facilitate those efforts between the North and the South and all of our partner agencies, and we would ask for your help in that area. The last topic, I will turn back over to our colleagues at UNR. Thank you. Thank you, Megan Kamlasi again for the record. Just to follow up on Dean Gerstenberger's final points there, workforce development is key to public health. Public health is a, a service heavy um, field and our, our public health workforce is the greatest asset of public health. So we need to invest in strategic workforce development to meet the state's specific immediate needs. We need to improve talent pipelines and expand wor workplace learning opportunities. Um, at the UN UNR School of Public Health, we're hoping to expand de degree off offerings in the near future to include a doctor of public health as well as a PhD in health communication and a few other 
other programs, um, but really we're leaning into the areas where we see that the state has needs, it has needs at the higher levels, of public health leaders, um, to really equip them to do the jobs that they need to do to keep the state healthy. Um, and we need funding to be able to support these advances in workforce. And then finally, something that you'll hear about if you haven't yet this session is support for graduate assistantships. Um, we essentially need more funding to help recruit and retain graduate assistants and postdoctoral scholarships in the state to bring expertise to the state to keep it um, and to make the schools more competitive and increase enrollment. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Again, we are happy to answer any questions and we appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Ms. Kamlasi. In the interest of time, I will ask committee members to please take their questions offline, but thank you so much for sharing uh, your collaboration and we look forward to continuing to support our schools of public health. So thank you so much. Let's move on to Senate Bill 41, which revises provisions relating to child welfare today. Um, we do have uh, members from NACO, uh, so please proceed when you are ready. And, and just in the interest of time, because we will be losing a few members uh, to a separate committee meeting, um, you know, just try to make the presentation as Must be really please. fast. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair, and members of the Senate Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Vincent Guthrow. Uh, for the record, it's spelled V-I-N-S-O-N, last name Guthrow, G-U-T-H-R-E-A-U. And I serve as the Executive Director of the Nevada Association of Counties, or NACO. Um, on behalf of the NACO Board of Directors, whose members are all 17 of Nevada's counties, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 41, a bill that addresses child welfare services. Um, I also have a co-presenter with me, um, Joanna Jacob, Government Affairs Manager from Clark County. And given the technical nature of child welfare service delivery and funding and the specialized population that these services impact, we also have Jill uh, Morano, who's on Zoom, I believe. Um, she's Clark County um, Child and Family Services Department Director and with us in the audience. Um, should the committee have any specific questions on, on that um, is also Ryan Gustafson. He's the Division Director for the Washoe County Human Services Agency. Um, I will present the need for this bill, and then if it pleases the chair, I'll ask Clark County to outline the specific uh, funding mechanisms for Clark and Washoe counties. Uh, most of my comments will focus on the service delivery, collective county funding, and our partnership with the state. Um, let me begin that our, uh, with that, the fact that our goal with this legislation is to bring clarity and understanding provides, and provide solutions to child welfare funding reductions in service delivery. While better understanding legislative and regulatory changes and how they have um, they impact these services. First of all, for, for the committee, all counties are involved in child welfare services. Currently, the services are delivered and funded in a hybrid format. Um, in counties over 100,000, which is currently Clark and Washoe counties, services are funded through a block grant from the state, which is made up of state funding and federal funding. These counties then supplement with general fund dollars, if needed, to deliver prevention, investigation, foster care, and adoption services in those communities. In our rural counties, the state of Nevada delivers these services and then assesses the counties um, for those services. To summarize, the proposal before this committee seeks to do uh, two things. One, uh, require a study to be conducted by the Joint Interim Health and Human Services Committee in the 23-24 um, interim that would examine the funding of agencies that provide child welfare services. This would include state and federal unfunded mandates, um, the impact of any funding reductions from the federal government, and the ability of any child welfare agencies to meet federal requirements. Additionally, the study would look at reductions under the Medicaid and uh, Child's Health Insurance Program, commonly known as CHIP, and as noted in the amendment before you, ad additional factors that came up in our discussion um, on the need for this bill, including economic factors such as the increase in cost of living, which has impacted our state's foster families, and any changes we may collectively need um, to the state's centralized information system, um, which is known as UNITY. Um, the report to be submitted by January 15th of 2025 to the legislature would also include solutions and policy recommendations to respond to any funding reductions that may be identified in the interim study. The approach is to review fiscal impacts to both urban and rural counties, along with the state from, signif uh, from significant policy, policy changes since 2011. Secondly, SB 41 seeks to modernize and update terminology around the block grant funding program that accurately reflects how these funds are used. 
Uh, my co-presenter um, will speak to Clark County specific impacts, but also provide the overview on the aforementioned uh, block grant funding and the accountability measures as well. I wanted to highlight for this committee the impacts of unfunded mandates as counties and the state grapple with a surge in assessments, but, see a, uh, but, uh, but we also see a lack of uh, corresponding service calls or needs. For instance, according to Churchill County, they've seen an overall assessment increase in the six-figure range, but they have actually relatively stable or even a decrease in service calls year over year. Lyon County's assessments went from just over 387,000 to, to well over 863,000 in, in the current uh, year, which is over double the assessment amount. And according to information from Lyon County, their youth population has not increased significantly in that county, and there has not been a corresponding amount of service calls to match the assessment. Rural counties for years have been trying to understand um, these increased assessments, and we believe the best way for the state to get a handle on these is to conduct the proposed study. We share the goal of the state that public dollars and resources should be getting to the populations they are intended to serve. In this case, at-risk youth, those in foster care, victims of sexual exploitation. We understand that public resources are finite, and we seek to maximize those available resources. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to Joanna Jacob, Government Affairs Manager from Clark County to discuss the block grant funding piece. So thank you, Joanna Jacob, for the record. Um, good afternoon, Senator Donate um, and members of the committee. Um, I am the Government Affairs Manager for Clark County and I'll try and keep my part brief. <laughs> I know um, we have a lot to cover, so I appreciate, but I appreciate the time. I wanted to talk specifically about um, the history of the policy changes that the system has had to absorb and that's putting the pressure on our systems. Um, this began with a bill in 2013, well before the time, I guess, of people who may be on this committee today, but it was before its time and extended youth support known as Step Up um, for our youth who are transitioning out of foster care. That was a very innovative program that was begun by Legal Aid, again, before its time, and we still are operating it today, but it is operated 100% out of our general fund. Um, we also have had bills through the year. I, was, I won't list them all, but there's some really um, notable bills that have been the policy of this legislature that are um, not they don't come with funding services for us and that has included um, the efforts that this body has done on commercially sexually exploited children their bill in there's been several bills on this but the that big move is coming where they're transitioning from the juvenile justice system to our child welfare system for um, the Clark County, the estimated cost in the upcoming biennium is $21 million per year for us to handle the population that we expect. We also have worked on extended foster care, um, which is really updating that, that program that I described, our step up program to help our youth remaining in care up to the age of 21, but with additional supports um, that they may need as they're transitioning out of foster care. We have estimated a cost to Clark County um, of over 2.9 million over the biennium, it, should that bill come forward. I know um, we are working on legislation this session to address that. We have had to, um, there's been costs associated when we implemented specialized foster care, which is a foster care level of treatment that is a, additional supports for kids who can't be served in traditional foster care homes. Um, Clark County has been subsidizing um, the rates that are paid to those foster care families so we can ensure the, that that service is there in our community and that has been a cost of $9 million um, over the biennium. This is $9 million after we partially offset the costs by, um, with the 4E funding. We have many more, but those are just a few that we have had to absorb. Um, and we, we have recognized that these programs are the public policy of the state, uh, but without, however, what we're trying to address is the issue of significant policy shifts without companion funding. We are currently operating at an op uh, approximately $28 million do structural budget deficit in Clark County. That means our expenditures are exceeding the revenue that's coming in. Um, and the, this is due to a number of factors, which also does include the loss of federal funding that we've seen um, due, the, due to the implementation of the Federal Families First Act. 
Um, we have bills in this legislative session to address some of these components, um, but we've had seen an increased cost for staffing and workload due to the bills that I mentioned. And we also are struggling with outdated federal requirements um, for income to make services available under 4E. Those income eligibility guidelines for some of these services are frozen at 1996 levels. So you can imagine the changes that we've seen in our society since 1996. And so to qualify families for those services, they often have to meet 1996 federal poverty guidelines, and we have seen significant change in that area. When the block grant was initially put in place um, in the state level, there was a similar, uh, this was a great program, and but it was put in place and the capped, the amount that we received in the funding was capped at 2011 level of funding. Um, and that was, at that time, a portion of that funding was also carved out to act as an incentive for us to apply back to the state for program improvement. So we're applying back to the state for 2011 funding. Um, what we're trying to fix in this bill, and Mr. Guthrow mentioned this is what I'm trying to outline on the changes to the um, incentive application, and I will note here that we have a conceptual amendment. I like to try and write up the changes to the bills, but this one, we really wanted to make our statement clear here on this. this, this Funding is not really operating as an incentive for us anymore, given our deficits. Um, and as regulatory and legislative changes have been added to the child welfare agencies, both at the federal and state level. Uh, Washoe and Clark County, um, we are subject to significant oversight by the state. Numerous reports, um, those include a biennial improvement plan um, under 432B. Under 432B, uh, the state is also allowed to place the, the child welfare agencies in Washoe and Clark on a corrective action plan if we don't meet program objectives. We also have a committee to review child fatalities. We have a quarterly quality improvement case review process, a five-year services review, a five-year family and services plan that also requires annual progress and services updates. So the proposal in SB 41, when we talked about this with our sister agency in Washoe County and also with the state, is that we are looking to align some of this reporting. Um, some of it operates in the same way. And what we are proposing to do under the conceptual amendment, I guess I'll just say to save time, is that we want to align what we were applying for the state in that incentive grant with what we are already doing also with our annual agency improvement plan. It's biennial right now. We'd like to take it to annual. Uh, we talked to the state also about aligning that. Right now it's due in December. We'd like to align it with the state fiscal year. Um, and the goal is really simply to streamline the reporting for us and for the state, honestly, um, and align it to the fiscal year. It's easier for us to do, um, and it also helps us to delete uh, duplicative reporting that we're doing, and it helps us to um, prioritize our focus to on these meaningful improvement activities that we are trying to do, um, and it also maintains appropriate oversight by DCFS. We want to make sure that we continue to be stewards of this public funding. So before I turn it back over to Mr. Guthrie, I just want to thank NACO for bringing this bill. In the, in the past year, we have struggled not only with our structural deficit, but with an increase in acuity of the overall number, uh, overall number of kids who are coming into our system. We have well over 100 parents who have surrendered their children to our system because they've not been able to find community mental health resources. Um, we know this committee is well aware of the critical service that our agencies provide in our community. It's not about, this bill is not about criticizing the legislature. It's not about criticizing past legislatures, the past gubernatorial administrations, or any of those things. Much of the policy has been in place for years, but we are struggling with shifting federal mandates that we are receiving um, and significant policy changes. And that's why we're asking for the study because we think it's time for a review over 10 years later um, of how we fund child welfare in the state. We are partners with NACO um, and with Washoe and the state and that's why we are proposing to do this together. So thank you for your time. I'll give it back to Mr. Guthrow. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I know um, Ms. Jacob mentioned the conceptual amendment. I'm, I'm happy to just walk through it briefly, if that's okay. Or if I not, think we, we can, can go ahead there. and skip that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Happy to take any questions then. Uh, committee members, I will limit it to one question each. If there's any questions, we don't have any. We'll go ahead and move on to testimony in support of this bill. If there is anyone in this room that would like to support uh, Senate Bill 41, you may go ahead and come up to the stand. Don't have anyone. BPS, is there anyone virtually? If you'd like to testify in support, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for support at this time. Thank you so much. Anyone in opposition to Senate Bill 41? BPS, is there anyone virtually? If you'd like to testify in opposition, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no calls for opposition at this time. Thank you so much. And is there anyone in neutral on Senate Bill 41? BPS, is there anyone virtual? If you'd like to testify in neutral, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. And Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Thank you so much. Did you have any closing remarks? Okay. okay, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 41. Let's move on to Senate Bill 161, which provides uh, for the use of certain federal benefits to purchase menstrual products. Today with, we have with us Senator Scheibel, so please proceed when you're ready. Thank you so much for having us here today to present SB 171 to you. Uh, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I'm the state senator for District 9, and this one's going to be really easy because you all support it. Um, literally, every senator signed on to this bill, and um, I am pleased to bring it to your committee today uh, for consideration. What Senate Bill 161 does is allows for individuals receiving benefits from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance or Special Supplemental Nutrition Nutrition Assistance Program for Women, Infants, and Children, better known as SNAP and WIC, to use those benefits to purchase menstrual products. Menstrual products are described by the National Conference of State Legislatures as hygiene materials used to catch blood flow during the menstrual cycle, typically needed from puberty until menopause. Commonly referred to as tampons, sanitary pads, menstrual cups, and other products, they are necessities, not luxuries. However, they are not always treated as such. Even though menstrual, menstrual products are basic necessities, they are, there are unfortunately no programs in place um, that are funded by public funds to provide them to those in needs. In fact, some people have reported using pieces of cardboard, cloth, toilet paper, newspapers, or even public bathroom paper towels as an alternative to increasingly unaffordable sanitary menstrual products. To some people, these may, may seem like healthy alternatives. For others, these may be the only alternatives that they can afford. However, they're not safe alternatives, and using them can result in vaginal discomfort and even worse, infections that can be life-threatening. The rising cost of menstrual products continues to put people in period poverty, creating barriers that prevent them from having safe, healthy monthly cycles. The National Conference of State Legislatures highlights a study that surveyed low-income women in St. Louis and found that 64% of them had experienced difficulty affording menstrual products. In that same study, 64% of female high school students reported not being able to afford these products at least once, and 34% reported having to miss school due to the lack of menstrual supplies. In Nevada, Governor Sisolak signed Assembly 224 in 2021 to break down the barriers of period poverty. This bill, now codified in the Nevada Revised Statutes, requires charter schools, middle schools, and high schools to provide menstrual products in school bathrooms at no cost to students. Other states have taken steps to increase access to menstrual products, such as requiring free menstrual products in correctional facilities and homeless shelters. In 2018, Congress passed the First Step Act, which requires all federal prisons to make sanitary napkins and tampons available free of charge. Then H.R. 1882, Menstrual Equity for All Act of 2019, was introduced expanding programs to include access to menstrual hygiene products for public school students, the incarcerated, the homeless, those who use health care flexible spending accounts, also known as HSAs, and Medicaid recipients. However, the bill was never voted on. In 2020, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act, better known as the CARES Act, was signed into law allowing for menstrual products to be paid for with pre-tax dollars using an HSA. By allowing people to purchase menstrual products through SNAP, we knock down costs as a barrier to accessing these essential items. 
I'm going to walk through the sections of the bill briefly. There are only a few of them. Um, Section 1 authorizes the recipients of SNAP or the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for WIC to use these benefits to purchase menstrual products. The section also states that the Department of Health and Human Services shall take the necessary actions to get federal authorizations to make Section 1 happen, including but not limited to applying for a federal waiver. And lastly, this section defines menstrual products. I'm now going to hand it over to my co-presenter, Samantha Glover, who is the co-founder and advocacy director for Red Equity, and she'll t speak to you a little bit more about period poverty and the details of the bill. Hi, um, I'm Samantha Glover, for the record, that's S-A-M-A-N-T-H-A-G-L-O-V-E-R. Um, like Senator Scheibel said, I'm the advocacy director of Red Equity, a nationwide nonprofit founded in Nevada um, that focuses on eliminating period poverty through advocacy, distribution, and education. Um, I'll keep this uh, really short and sweet because I know everybody has places to go, um, but I would like you to remind everyone that period poverty does not only include um, socioeconomic economic factors that contribute to these situations where people don't have access to menstrual products. Um, due to the significant social stigma surrounding menstruation, um, really impacts the accessibility of menstrual products as well. One in four high school students miss school because they don't have access to menstrual products. And in more of a general situation, or situation of the population, 51% of women just in the United States report using menstrual products for longer than um, recommended, which can have significant health impacts and cause potentially life-threatening infections due to the inaccessibility of menstrual products. I'd also like to remind all legislators um, that menstrual products are free in all of the women's bathrooms inside this legislative building, um, and that should be a, a norm in all public rooms, and especially public restrooms, and um, and this bill takes significant steps in leading the way in the country to provide menstrual products and menstrual equity for everyone. Illinois was the only other state to pass this type of legislation, and it was passed in 2022. And New Jersey currently has um, an almost identical bill um, in the process of their legislature. But thank you. And we are available for questions. Thank you so much. Any committee members with any questions? Agreed. I don't think we have any questions, so we'll go ahead and move on to testimony. So um, is there anyone in this room that is uh, willing to testify in support of Senate Bill 161? Looks like there's quite a few folks, so we'll start from Christine and we'll go down this way. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. My name is Christina Kleist here from Brownstein here on behalf today of Seven Points LLC. Uh, first, we would like to thank Senator Scheibel for bringing forward this bill. We strongly believe feminine hygiene products should be included as a part of an individual's Medicaid coverage, and this will help countless individuals. We do hope this proposed coverage will not be limited to only the most basic or common products available today. For instance, hemp-based hemp products and organic products um, are not only an environmentally friendly alternative, but one more and more OBGYNs are recommending as a preferred health care option for certain individuals. We hope that these products will be included in the coverage, giving women and doctors a better range of choices suitable for their needs. We strongly support this bill and urge you to support as well. Thank you. Hello, Chair Donate, members of the committee. Thank you for your time. I'll keep this brief. For the record, my name is Nathan Noble, N-A-T-H-A-N-N-O-B-L-E. I am a student at the university. I'm a senator for ASUN. I wear many hats. Mm -hmm. But today, I'm coming to you as a person who is concerned about the epidemic of period poverty. It is fundamentally one of the most inexcusable and unnecessary forms of injustice in our society. It is something that is absolutely needless. And I am personally proud to belong to an institution, the University of Nevada, Reno, that has taken steps to combat it. I think this is a wonderful piece. And if indeed you all support it, I think that you are all on the right side of history for this one and I appreciate all the support that you are giving to this. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Donate. I'm sorry, it's been a while. And, and members of your committee, this afternoon I'd like to thank uh, Senator Scheibel for bringing this legislation forward. And we at Retail Association, in an effort to just let you out, you out of here, um, we support this bill and the concept that she's brought forward. Thank you. Did you want to repeat your name for the record one more time, please, for us? Oh, I'm sorry. I did not say my name. <laughs> Liz McMiniman, Retail Association in Nevada. 
Thank you so much, ma'am. Is there anyone else in support? Let's go to BPS, anyone virtually. If you'd like to testify in support, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Hello, this is Wendy Schweigart, founder of Project Maryland in Southern Nevada. I just wanted to give my testimony in support of this bill. Project Maryland fights uh, period poverty. We serve over 2,000 clients every month, and period supplies are not a luxury. They are a necessity, and we are fully in support of this bill so that everyone can have access and make their own choices of how they spend their funds. Thank you so much. Once again, if you'd like to testify in support, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y-C-O-L-E, uh, volunteer faculty for UNR Psychiatry. And I want to thank Senator Scheibel. My personal senator, when I still lived in Las Vegas until two years ago, we have some interesting women in our psychiatry residency at UNR who are going to pursue careers in reproductive psychiatry. This is phenomenal and exciting. I want to say that menstrual products really are essential necessities, and how amazing half of all Nevadans for decades of their lives will be using them. These products have to be covered. And if you think about it, my grandmother described stuffing rags in her bloomers in the early 1900s. I want to believe we've come a long way since then. And also observe that from a medical standpoint, leaving tampons in place for too long exposes women to the risk of toxic shock syndrome. Pads, tampons, cups should all be covered through SNAP, WIC, whatever. These are not high ticket items. They are within our ability to cover these items. Thank you. Please support SB 161. Chair, there are no more callers at this time. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and move on to testimony in opposition to this bill. There's no one here. Is there anyone online? BPS. Chair, there are no callers for opposition at this time. Thank you so much. And is there anyone testifying in neutral on this measure? We don't have anyone here. Uh, BPS, anyone virtual? Chair, there are no callers for neutral. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Scheibel, any closing remarks? Yes, thank you. And I know that time is of the essence, but there is just a record that I have to make um, for a posterity that's very important because Wendy Schweiger is much too modest to tell you that this whole bill was actually her idea. And the way that this came to us at the legislature is that I was driving to work one morning and listening to the radio where Wendy was talking to some of our local morning DJs about what Project Maryland does. And she mentioned in her segment that um, people cannot use staff or WIC funds to buy period products, and that is a major contributor to period poverty. And so when I heard that, I cold called her, um, told her that we needed to fix this, and she has been um, you know, a great partner in ensuring that this legislation uh, came to fruition. But if it hadn't been for Wendy and her, her spot on morning radio in Las Vegas, none of us would be discussing this today. So I'm very grateful to her and to Project Maryland for bringing this to my attention, and I look forward to seeing this bill pass. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, at this time, I will go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 161. Um, we will go ahead and end today's meeting with public comment. So is there anyone that would like to provide public comment? We don't have anyone BPS. Is there anyone virtual? If you'd like to participate in public comment, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, I will go ahead and close public comment at this time. Members, any questions, comments? We don't have any. Uh, that concludes our meeting for today, and our next meeting will be Tuesday, March 7th at 3.30 p.m. The meeting is now adjourned.